Well, thank you everyone who um, has joined us this evening. I'm very excited um, that Dr. Sullivan has agreed to um, chat with us tonight about the wonderful world of naturopathic medicine and how we can approach brain health and specifically working with ADHD and anxiety um, and supporting in natural ways and um, maybe how we could start, uh, Dan, is if you want to just share a little bit about um, how you how you came to be a naturopathic doctor. I know there was some interesting bumps in your journey there. Maybe you could share a little bit with us. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I'll try to keep this short because it's definitely a long story. But um, yeah, I think growing up... Um, I was a hockey player, so I was always interested in how to optimize my performance on the ice specifically, and that translated over into just wanting to learn as much as possible about different you know, diets and supplements and what could I do to take my performance to the next level. Um, so midway through that, when I was in my teens, I was diagnosed with ADHD, and I was immediately put on various different types of medications, stimulant medications for that. And I really didn't know of any other option at the time. You know, what role diet had, what role getting any blood work to look at nutrient deficiencies or anything like that. It was just, you know, here's your diagnosis. And, um, you know, within a 20 minute office visit, I was prescribed a stimulant medication. So, after a while being on that, I ended up being on different stimulant medications for the next six or seven years. And over that period of time, slowly but surely, I was, you know, started to delve into reading books, listening to podcasts, just getting more uh, information about other methods that might help my brain health, that might help my focus without necessarily being on a prescription medication or hopefully to even lower the dose at least. And so I was playing college hockey at the time for the University of Maine. And uh, I met a mentor or who became a mentor of mine, Dr. Graves, who is a chiropractor. He was an acupuncturist and he practiced functional medicine. And he was the first doctor who really opened my eyes to this whole world of functional medicine. And I come into his office. I remember, I, you know, I was drinking a ton of Gatorade, just eating a lot of gluten processed foods. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, I'm eating protein. I'm doing all this stuff right because I'm an athlete. I'm, you know, carving up. And and he was just like, oh man, you are just, there, there's a lot of work to be done. And so uh, we did the work together and that really was kind of the, the inspiring time of my life where I started to develop an interest instead of playing professional hockey into actually helping people uh, because through working with him, I was able to actually come off of the ADHD medication entirely and have been off of that completely for the last uh, 10 plus years. So, and so yeah. maybe just because uh, there might be some people watching who aren't familiar with the term functional medicine. So maybe you could just give a brief explanation of what that is and maybe um a little bit of, of the why, like why, why in uh, the journey with your health did he recommend that you, um, you know, go off gluten and kind of looked at your diet as mm. a central thing? So functional medicine, the way I think about it, is uh, root cause medicine. So I, I think of that as different than the the, the typical conventional medicine model, which is more based around symptom relief, medication, surgery, things of that nature to really, um, you know, get people from a state of disease to symptom suppression or alleviation. Um, functional medicine, on the other hand, I think of as more of a long-term approach, a approach where we're addressing the root causes. And so 
to touch on that, that next question is, you know, what are the root causes or contributing factors of ADHD? Obviously, it's largely genetic. However, there are many contributing factors and factors that can make it significantly worse if they're not addressed and vice versa uh, can, can make the condition significantly more manageable if those things are investigated, are tested for, and then addressed. And so what, um, maybe just if it's okay to use yourself as the example, what did you notice when you went through the process of changing your diet and the work that you did? I was experiencing a lot of GI issues that I just sort of, you know, explained away. I just thought, oh, this is normal to have, you know, a lot of you know, abdominal discomfort, bloating, gas, indigestion. And, you know, a lot of brain fog as well that was somewhat mitigated from the use of the medications. However, there was a lot of side effects, like there was, you know, very hyper focusing, there was, you know, kind of an antisocial tendency, just getting too absorbed in the work, um, some anxiety as well with the stimulant medications. So for me, it was sort of a muddled uh, mix of symptoms that were kind of being improved by the medication, but then also kind of getting worse on a, uh, like an under the surface way, if you will. So for me, it was my gut started to improve first. And I would say the brain fog, just being able to think clearer that improved. And then over time I was able to then titrate off of the medication uh, which was a bit of a process. It wasn't easy necessarily, but um, I did notice that there was a big improvement after I did neurofeedback as well. That was a big player a couple years down the road of doing all that intervention that was really the cherry on top that really helped me out. Socially, I felt much more comfortable after doing neurofeedback. Um, I was just much more... I, I would say at ease, really. Terrific. And so when um, patients walk through your door and, you know, they're experiencing ADHD symptoms, maybe walk us through, you know, what, what do you look at? What do you focus on? And why do you focus on these things to help support, you know, improvement the way you experienced improvement? Well, I will meet with every new patient for approximately 90 minutes, so nine zero. So I really want to get to know them as a human being, get to understand what's going on in their lives, you know, what their relationships are like, what their diet's like, what you know, supplements or medications they might be on, um, their medical history, any traumatic brain injuries. So basically just trying to get as much data as possible about that person. That's what I call the subjective data. So what they're telling me and through that, I'll really under, you know, after doing this a lot, I can see patterns and based on that, it's all, you know, very individualized, but, um, based on that, I'll typically recommend certain testing. Usually that's going to include blood work for almost everybody, you know, test, we can get more into depth about that, but testing, you know, vitamin D, magnesium levels, hormone levels, like thyroid, testosterone, other sex hormones, inflammatory markers. Um, there's also a lot of different gut testing that I'll do a lot. GI map I'll do is a comprehensive stool analysis. Uh, for those not familiar with that, it's just a very comprehensive analysis of uh, your gut function. What's going on in there? Do you have any infections in there? Uh, what's the the health of the microbiome like? Do you have leaky gut? You know, which is a term that's thrown around a lot, or intestinal permeability. Um, so, I'll basically try to do my best to understand what I think is going on based on what they're telling me, and then pair that up with the objective data from the testing to determine how do we need to proceed. So um, a lot of there's a lot of commonalities in terms of the treatment 
in terms of you know optimizing vitamin D, for instance, magnesium, especially if they're on a stimulant medication, that's one of the first things that I'll address. Um, those are known to deplete magnesium levels, which can just lead to a vicious cycle. Right, lower magnesium levels equals more ADHD symptoms typically. Um, so it's 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 very individualized, and I feel like that's kind of where the magic is. Um, it's not a cookie cutter approach. So just depending on what is going on for them specifically, uh, we'll address that, and that's sort of why we're able to see um, good results with people. And can you talk a little bit about the sort of gut brain connection? Um, because there's been a lot of research coming out about how connected they are. There's new studies showing that you can identify autism spectrum based on the gut profile of the individual. And so maybe just uh, help people understand why the gut, what, what are we understanding about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was a big one in my life personally, and I find that the health of the gut in a lot of my patients is a big factor in their improvement um, or dysfunction for that matter. Uh, I would say that, gosh, there's there's so much to the gut-brain connection. So basically we have our brain and we have our gut and they're connected by the vagus nerve or cranial nerve 10. And they're basically... Um, all you need to know is there's constant communication from the gut up to the brain and then from the brain down to the gut. So there's a lot of, as you said, there's a lot of amazing research. I feel like we're still in the infancy of that and what specific strains of microorganisms affect different neurotransmitters or different uh, you know, neurological pathways or um, conditions like autism or ADHD. Um, a lot of, a lot of poor health can result in systemic inflammation, which can then exacerbate all kinds of mental health conditions. So it's well established that increased levels of inflammation result in increased levels of depression. I would say that I see the more inflamed somebody is, the worse any mental health condition that they already have typically is, like anxiety or ADHD. Um, what does that mean to be inflamed and, and what causes that? There is a lot of causes for that and a lot of things that you would typically think, uh, like stress, eating a poor diet, highly refined you know, foods. Um, inflammatory oils that are used very commonly in a lot of processed foods or a lot of restaurant foods. Um, it can be, there's increasing levels of research around pesticide use and the consumption of those and the, the detrimental effect on the gut microbiome. And so one thing that I'll, I'll talk about, which is leaky gut or intestinal permeability, that's something that I very often see in practice, I would say at least 75% of my patients that I test for come back with leaky gut. That's a really, uh, probably the most common form of, um, or the way somebody would become exposed to systemic inflammation from gut dysfunction. And I don't know if you want to go into depth about that, but um, essentially, the short ver version of that would be um, the cells lining the gut are very, uh, should be very tight together. And so when there's damage done to those gut cells from stress, the poor diet, all those things that I mentioned, alcohol um, disrupts the gut lining a lot, those cells will become permeable. So there, there will be larger spaces between those cells, letting different toxins, bacteria, undigested food particles in through the gut lining right into the bloodstream, causing the immune system to react and causing higher levels of inflammation that circulate around the body and brain. So that will trigger basically a lot of different downstream effects that don't do your mental health any good. Mm -hmm. That's very, 
very concise answer. Thank you. <laughs> and so if a family is um, going to start neurofeedback and, you know, for ADHD or anxiety for that matter, um, and they want to get the most out of it. So if they don't have the opportunity to work with a, a, a functional medicine doctor like yourself, what would you just recommend as kind of like best practices in terms of how they treat their body to help support their brain health and what their brain's going to want to do, you know, in changing through the neurofeedback? Mm -hmm. I would say from a, from a psychological perspective to try to, to try to stay as uh, stress-free as possible or to just have a, you know, a growth mindset. I would say that's very important in terms of the psychological component to gut health, to overall health um, through that gut brain connection. So if we're constantly stressed, um, we, it's my opinion that we can't really fix that with a proper diet. So I, I would say that's pro and I'm sure I'm barking up uh, your tree there. Um, but I think that's a big component. I think that eating whole foods in terms of the diet, staying away from the inflammatory uh, oils like the seed oils out there. Um, I think that two of the most common triggers uh, with ADHD are gluten and dairy in my experience. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has an issue with that, of course. Um, however, a lot of people do, and especially those with ADHD, in my experience, I've seen typically are more prone to being to those foods being problematic or exacerbating their symptoms. Um, I would say very important to be consuming protein regularly, uh, not skipping meals. Uh, that's something that a lot of, you know, us with ADHD will do is skip breakfast, you know, rush around, caffeinate, uh, and to try to make up for that. So I would say that's having protein with each meal and eating consistent meals throughout the day is very important. Um, regulating the circadian rhythm is another kind of simple fix for people that you know would yield much better um, health and better results with the neurofeedback, like eliminating blue light before bed, you know, from the electronics, for instance, the cell phone, iPod, iPad, TV, right? All those uh, blue light emitting devices are going to suppress melatonin and increased cortisol, uh, making it more difficult to fall asleep or to stay asleep. Um, and then I think in the morning as well, on the flip side, another way of anchoring in that 24 hour um, biological clock, the circadian rhythm would be to expose yourself to light, to natural light in the morning. And balancing the circadian rhythm is really important for those people with ADHD or just people in general, I would say. Um, it's, you know, our body's internal clock and a lot of different mechanisms are dependent on that working properly. Um, I think supplementation could be a big one as well, but I think that it's, you know, really the fundamentals are going to be the diet and the lifestyle first and foremost. I would start there. And what about exercise? What do you recommend in terms of, you know, if someone is kind of maybe not totally committed to exercise, what would you sort of recommend as the minimum? I would say a minimum of 20 to 30 minutes every day would be, would be the minimum. So whether that's walking outside, whether that's playing a sport, whether that's, you know, going to the gym and lifting weights, whether that's doing some type of cardiovascular activity, you know, running, cycling, swimming, um, I would say though, that I do highly encourage patients and especially kids with ADHD to take up some kind of team sport, especially like a racket sport to really engage the cerebellum, which is that, that back part of the brain that's responsible for accuracy, balance, coordination, eye movements. And so that can really help, um, people, especially with ADHD, because they found some deficiencies in cell cerebellar function in those with ADHD and, um, not to get too much into the weeds, but that can really help the frontal lobe or the, 
the front part of the brain to function and fire appropriately, uh, which is you know responsible for our executive function, our decisions, planning, and so forth. All takes place in that area, and so those team sports, racket sports, and you know pickleball is really picking up steam out here in California. I don't know about New York. Um, it is, but is it? Yeah, everywhere it's it's taken over. But uh, yeah, I think those are great, and then um, yeah, I think whatever people really enjoy is also an important component too. So if you know you love to swim or you love to bike, great. You know, do that. I think anything you know pr practiced on a consistent basis uh, is is fantastic. And what about like food additives, food dyes? Do you see much of an um, allergy or sensitivity to those contributing? Those definitely do contribute. It's usually, you know, people will come in and it's, those will usually go together with consuming processed foods and, you know, doing the other lifestyle habits that are, aren't uh, beneficial for ADHD. And so, but yes, you know, the studies do indicate um, people generally do better avoiding those processed foods, the additives, the artificial sweeteners, the dyes, uh, the colorings, etc. And what do you see, like, when people are presenting to you and they're saying, you know, I have brain fog, I can't focus, um, I'm just easily distracted, or I'm, you know, what else is kind of on your list of things to rule out or look into that might be masking or masquerading as what we might sort of call ADHD or some neurodivergent issue? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's, so I think it depends on the sex of the individual. So for females, for instance, you know, if they're experiencing brain fog, you know, I'll also ask about dizziness, uh, going from sitting to standing, that would more point me in the direction of iron deficiency, like easy bruising, you know, um, I would think about thyroid conditions. Hypothyroidism is a big one that I see a lot that can mimic certain symptoms of ADHD, um, anemia, uh, B12 anemia. I see that a lot, especially in people that have um, MTHFR mutations, which is a genetic um, component um, of the, the body's ability of, of processing uh, vitamin B9 uh, and activating that properly. Um, you know, other various mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, uh, low levels of different hormones, like low testosterone in men. Testosterone has a massive impact on the frontal lobe and activating the frontal lobe properly. And therefore, uh, its effect also on dopamine, which is typically lower in those with ADHD. So that's something that to look out for in men. Um, yeah, diff a lot of different gut issues, I would say, can mimic that, you know, chronic stress and adrenal function. There's a lot of different things that, that can mimic that. And I would say it's also, it can kind of get a little muddled in terms of what exactly is going on or what conditions does this person have uh, usually there are multiple layers that we have to sort through to get to those root causes and that's why it typically takes that full 90 minutes to to get through the initial intake and then also paired up with the testing so that i know okay you know this person is not anemic their thyroid is functioning optimally they're okay their hormones are functioning properly we kind of just dig past those layers um, to try to get to the root cause of what's going on. But there are a lot of different conditions and deficiencies that can look like or exacerbate an underlying mental health condition. Yeah, I had a, a client who was doing the neurofeedback. And um, after the first, one of the, her main complaints was just feeling like, I can't focus. 
I'm exhausted. I just feel drained. And then the end of her first month and she did her checklist and it was exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And the end of her second month, she's like, it's still the same. And I was like, okay, you know, now we have to play detective, right? To understand what is keeping your brain from making those changes that we would expect. Why is that not happening? And long story short, it turned out she had Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she started um, getting treated for that, you know, she was able to, you know, recover a lot of her feelings of, you know, energy and engagement and focus. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I always say to people, like, let's not assume there's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we always want people, if the extent to which they can choose a lifestyle that is conducive to brain health, we want them to do that, right? That's sure. not always, you know, a priority regardless of whether they're doing the neurofeedback or just kind of living their their lives we we know the brain is such an important organ to take care of but what i always say is if we don't see the changes we're expecting from the neurofeedback then we're going to encourage you know peeling back like you said the layers to look at where is the root cause you know that thinking about it like you know an apple falling right? It will because of gravity, right? So people's brains will want to improve their functioning when they do the neurofeedback. But if there's something in the way, that apple won't fall to the ground. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just appreciating that, that we don't want to assume this is here, but we want to pay close attention. Um, mm -hmm. Because if that dynamic brain is rigid in its patterns, right? Rigidity in the brain's functioning tells us there is less than optimal performance because the brain, brain is a dynamic system. Mm -hmm. So um, in our few minutes left, I would love to chat with you a bit about anxiety and just um, kind of how you approach supporting someone who's working with uh, anxiety you know, through um, diet, any particular supplements that you think are important or, you know, what, what you encourage for, for someone in that position? Well, I think that some of what I'll, I'll recommend is from a psychological perspective. So mm -hmm. doing things like visualization um, with anxiety, it's, Sometimes it's, you know, we can definitely support them with diet, um, bal balancing blood sugar. Uh, that's a big one in terms of um, if blood sugar is dysregulated, people can have a massive uptick in anxiety through that blood sugar dysregulation. So I think that same rule applies to those with anxiety as ADHD, like, you know, consuming regular protein throughout the day, making sure that you're consuming whole foods, a lot of vegetables, fiber, and healthy fats that help to balance and stabilize blood sugar throughout the day, just to give yourself, you know, the most chance possible, the best chance to, um, you know, physiologically to uh, meet the anxiety and to overcome the anxiety. I would say, depending on the severity of it, we can do things like L-theanine, for instance, GABA. Uh, there's lithium orate is a not too well known supplement, uh, mm -hmm. not the same as lithium carbonate, the bipolar uh, pharmaceutical medication. But this is a, a nutraceutical uh, that can be very helpful. Low dose lithium orate for those with anxiety. Um, but I think. Neurofeedback is definitely very helpful for the anxiety and kind of rewiring that loop in the brain. Um, that's one, you know, just free version of that is doing visualization. It's visualizing yourself in the uh, in a in a very calm and relaxed state. Granted, so that you're not firing that. Uh, amygdala loop so when when people have anxiety they basically the brain will bypass the frontal lobe entirely and will fire off as you know into right into the amygdala which is our fear center in the side of the brain 
And so when that happens, we don't have access to the executive function, our higher uh, self, if you will. And so doing that visualization of seeing yourself encountering those situations that you would find yourself typically having anxiety in, and then having a clear mental picture of yourself moving through those situations and not being triggered or having another you know, neuro pathway, another option to take. Um, I think that that's really effective and I'll, I'll tell, I'll recommend that to a lot of my patients to do that. In addition to the dietary stuff, um, you know, if, for instance, like if they're anemic, iron deficiency, anemic, that can exacerbate anxiety massively too. So it's important to you know, address any underlying physiological dysfunctions that might be at play. And then also kind of address it from that. I call it like a top down mm -hmm. approach, more of the mindset or um, things of that nature. Also the bottom up, which I call just crudely uh, physiology, supplementation, diet, things like that. That's great. And that's something, you know, when people are hooking themselves up to neurofeedback, you know, doing a visualization like that when they're doing their session would mm. be a really nice pairing together. So thank you for offering that visualization practice because mm -hmm. I think that would go well with Oh, that. yeah, definitely. Very well, in fact, yeah. And so um, I don't want to take too much of your time. Thank you for all of your wonderful information. I do want to see if anybody has any questions. Um, if you do, you're welcome to just put them in the chat box um, or you can unmute yourself um, and ask your question. And while we're seeing if anybody has any questions, so typically what what is the time frame? Like if someone is diligent in working, you know, whatever they need to do on their end to make the changes, what do you typically expect is the outcome for people and over what time frame if someone has ADHD or is working with anxiety, just to kind of give people a, a sense of, of how long it takes? Well, it's that's a good question. I think it 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 can take varying lengths of time depending on the amount of underlying issues that that person might have. For instance, if they have a lot of different gut issues upon doing a stool analysis, that sort of takes, you know, uh, certain phases that we need to go through to address those things first. Um, typically, what I'll see for people, is they will see progress very soon, typically some kind of progress from being on the initial supplements that we recommend from, do, you know, doing the initial lifestyle changes, it's sort of a progression. Again, it, it can depend, but it's usually for most people, I would say we, we started working with people only in a, in a three month capacity minimum at this point now, because I think it takes a minimum of about that amount of time to see meaningful change that they can then carry out, you know, building those habits and carrying out themselves. Sometimes it will take longer, six months to a year, if there's chronic complex disease going on, autoimmunity going on, a lot of different uh, other factors um, going on. And then as well, if they're just um, you know, could be older individuals, typically children, you know, we, I see pretty quick progress on, um, if they're on, you know, if there's polypharmacy, so they're on a lot of different medications that can take some time to sort of figure all that out, see what's necessary, what's not. Um, so if they're on a lot of medications, again, that can take longer. Um, you know, I had, uh, a patient of mine, she was I think seven years old and she had ADHD, but wasn't on any medications, um, 
had you know significant progress within several weeks, two to three weeks, you know, going to the bathroom every day versus going once or twice a week, you know, focusing in school is significantly better. So think, you know, conditions or or situations like that, that are a little bit more straightforward, typically can see faster results. And then, you know, on the flip side, just the more complex, the, the longer stuff has been going on, the more stuff we have to wade through, you know, the longer it takes. Makes sense. I mean, this is, I think, one of the frustrations people have is they just understandably assume that we're all pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And so to really help people understand that, you know, particularly the brain compared to other organs, very unique. And so everybody has to look at their own personal situation um, and see that as, as a good thing. Um, Mm -hmm. You don't know the answer of exactly how long it would take for for that particular individual. But certainly, you know, following through and and the question that came through was, if you have any tips for parents who are who recognize or for themselves, probably for that matter, you know, where to start in improving diet? Like, do you do you have any kind of like if if you could change one or two things kind of in a child's diet or an adult's diet, what would you recommend? I think that an easy start for people would be to change one meal and that could be changing breakfast. So if they're not consuming breakfast at all, uh, I, I do encourage that for most people with ADHD to consume breakfast. Um, that being a breakfast that's relatively balanced in nutrition in terms of protein, carbohydrates, and fats uh, that has, you know, adequate protein in there. So that could be from uh, if you, you know, animal-based, it could be egg-based or um, turkey, you know, turkey sausage or chicken sausage, things of that nature, Um, vegetables like spinach or sweet potato hash, things like that. Or I find that a simple smoothie works wonders. So having some, whether that's plant-based protein powder or, you know, a whey-based protein powder, if they're able to do dairy, that with some, you know, frozen avocado, like I'll get some myself that's pre-chopped, it's frozen, you know, some frozen uh, organic berries, some coconut milk that's unsweetened, for instance, or almond milk, things like that, where you're getting a, you know, uh, a higher level of protein, uh, low sugar, low refined sugars, you know, so no fruit juice or um, even like pancakes and pastries and cereal and things of that nature are going to be very high in refined carbohydrates that are processed quickly by the body and then can lead to blood sugar imbalance. Also, a lot of them are going to contain gluten as well. Uh, which can be, like I said, again, problematic for some individuals with ADHD. Um, But that's where I, I, I if I had one thing to choose, it would be starting with breakfast that's more wholesome and then going from there. Great. Well, what kid doesn't want to shake for breakfast? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if it's... Taste, if you can make it taste good, which, you know, you definitely can, you can just, uh, you know, put some cacao in there as well to kind of make it uh, nice. And um, because I think, you know, picky eating is definitely a big aspect of ADHD as well. So you got to kind of, um, you know, pick your battles, but also, you know, do your best to try to meet in the middle as well. Right. Well, I don't see any more questions. So I want to thank you, Dan, so much for meeting with us, sharing your wisdom and your personal story. Um, it's, you know, parents just and and individuals, you know, we're all just looking for the right information to help us take our next step in our health. And so I feel like your information was very valuable and appreciate you sharing it and taking the time to chat. Of course. With us. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. All right. Well, enjoy the California sunset and um, hopefully we'll have another opportunity to speak again. Definitely. I'm looking forward to it.
All right. And thank you, everybody who joined us tonight. Um, And those in the recording, thanks for listening. All right. Bye, everyone.